Come on in. Welcome to Idle Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about five more surprisingly underused Survivor strategies. Last week, I talked about five strategies I think are underutilized in Survivor, and many of you in the comments pointed out even more strategies that Survivor players could be using, but just aren't. So I thought I'd cover some of those and the creative players who most famously implemented them. Even though this is a sequel to last week's original video, I'll just be counting down from 5 to 1 again and you can consider these numbers 10 through 6 uh, if you want. It really doesn't matter. All that said, let's dig into five more surprisingly underused survivor strategies. At number five is baiting a member of the majority alliance into being incredibly obnoxious when you're in the minority, most famously used by Brian in Survivor Guatemala. At the Guatemala swap, the old Yasha on new Yasha are outnumbered by old Nakum three to four. Although down in numbers, Brian realizes quickly that Blake doesn't really fit in with the culture of his tribe and doesn't seem particularly well liked by his fellow tribe mates, Danny, Bobby John, and Brandon. Blake is completely obsessed with bragging about his hookups and the sizes of their various body parts, blissfully unaware that literally no one in human history has enjoyed hearing a hookup story. My girlfriend, she's got double B. She's got big boobs. Really? But then she got the pill. Yeah. Make you bigger. Beautiful storytelling. It's like I can picture them. So knowing that Blake's personality is wearing thin on the rest of old Nakum, Ryan hatches a plan to save himself teeing up Blake at every opportunity possible to talk about his various conquests, much to the irritation of everyone else. I have a new favorite game out here. It's called Bait Blake. Like, what is your absolute best drunk story? Oh God. All Brian, Gary, and Amy need is for one Nakum to be so annoyed by Blake that they swap their vote and it works. Both Danny and Bobby John end up voting for Blake, buying Brian another round in the game. This is classic, amazing social play, and Brian played it perfectly. Proof that you should never throw in the towel at an unfavorable swap. There's always some room to maneuver. Recognizing the weak link in the majority alliance, laser focusing on the personality flaw that makes them so disliked, then teeing them up into constantly displaying that personality flaw in full view of everyone, so much so that the majority alliance would rather lose a number than live with that person for one more day, is genuine inspired gameplay. I've got to say, Bait Blake is certainly one of the best moves pulled by a pre-merger ever. I mean, it certainly beats the B Blake strategy. At number four is planting an idle clue in someone's bag to cause chaos, most famously used by Pete in Survivor Philippines. In Philippines, Tandang was on a hot streak, one of the rare tribes to never lose an immunity challenge pre-merge. Because of that winning streak, there's not much strategizing to do. And because of all the rain, all the Tandang players really can do is sit around and think. Lisa's thinking about her past as a childhood star and how that can guide her game now. RC's wondering why Abby Maria decided to hate her and how to mend that relationship moving forward. Scoopin's dreaming about, well, um, never mind. Let's not get into what Scoopin's dreaming about. Pete is spending his free time thinking about how he can cause chaos at camp to gain control of the tribe. Pete's goal is ultimately to neutralize RC as much as possible, both by voting off her closest ally Mike, as well as by breaking up her and Abby. So he decides to plant the idol clue, which he got from Abby Maria, in RC's bag, where it then falls out in front of everyone. It works beautifully, putting a major target on RC and driving the final wedge between her and Abby, who feels betrayed that RC, uh, went and dug up their idol clue? Of course, Abby's outrage is all very rich, considering she found the idol the episode prior and didn't tell RC about it, but that's why we love her. Pete gains full strategic control of the camp, which he would have until the merge. Considering the saturation of idols and advantages in Survivor and their accompanying rules explanations, I'm surprised more players don't utilize those little slips of paper by planting them in other players' property. 
I mean, it's not like anyone at this point needs the rule sheet on how to play an idol. You won't lose much by planting it. I mean, sure, complex modern advantages allow you to, like, use a truth serum on someone like you're Saeed from Lost, or literally turn back time like you're in season 5 of Lost. So maybe it's best to keep those slips of paper in case you need to consult the rule book. But idol clues? I'd love to see more players use them to frame others and cause chaos. It could be well worth your time. Unlike Lost. At number 3 is baiting the other finalists into tanking their own final tribal council, most famously used by Chris in Survivor Vanuatu. There is no greater final tribal council performance in Survivor history than Chris's in my opinion. The man is a BS artist for the ages who smoothed over a hostile jury by telling them exactly what each of them needed to hear to win his vote. Apologetic, vulnerable, complimentary, Chris's tone changed depending on who he was speaking to, but importantly, he always came off as sincere, even though he most certainly was not. But his incredible Final Tribal Council didn't even start at Final Tribal. It started on the morning of day 39, when he begins to doubt whether he can actually win over Twyla. So just to increase his odds, he makes sure that she'll tank her game with the jury. Reading the jury is an art, and Chris understood that this particular jury was angry at the two of them, many felt betrayed, and they were bitter. They wanted to be apologized to and have their egos stroked. Chris knew that, but Twyla didn't. Chris spends their time together on day 39 talking about how he's not going to let the jury bully him into apologizing and convinces Twyla to do the same, despite how detrimental it will be to her game. You know, I just think about some of the people on the jury taking their disappointment out on us. And they will. I really don't know if I'm inclined to sit there and let them do that. I mean, I just sit and think, well, I know Twyla ain't gonna take no crap, so I'm not gonna take no crap. I'm not. Chris, you sly dog. Twyla nukes what little chance she had of winning by getting combative and argumentative with several of the jurors, while Chris kisses their feet. JT and Natalie both implemented similar Day 39 strategies as well. JT acted all buddy-buddy with Steven during their Day 39 breakfast, and catches him extremely off guard when he digs into him hard at Final Tribal. And Natalie, understanding that Russell's ego is his downfall, let him spend day 39 building up his own blindside heavy game in his mind, only for Russell to later realize that the jury didn't want to reward someone who was cruel and relished humiliating others, no matter how strong they were strategically. Uh, twice. Too many players get caught up in the celebration of making the end that they don't remember that there is still game to be played. Your final day on the island can be spent setting yourself up for success, but it can also be spent setting your opponents up for failure. It can also be spent cutting avocados in the most baffling and offensive way possible. Wow, I'm glad this vote was unanimous for JT. At number two is waiting until right before Tribal Council to make a plan, most famously implemented by Tony and Survivor Winners at War. By the mid-merge of Winners at War, there was one player whose continued existence in the game seriously posed a major strategic threat to Tony. <laughs> no, it's not Ben. That would be Sophie, who was not only playing an incredible, probably winning game in a strong majority position, but who's also not super in Tony's corner and could potentially pull his closest ally, Sarah, away from him. With the majority alliance splitting votes between Michelle and Jeremy, Tony senses an opportunity to pull in those two, plus Nick, to pull off a 4-3-2 against the biggest threat in the game. But Tony doesn't spend the whole afternoon getting everyone on board. If Sophie senses anything is wrong, there's risk she could flip it back around on one of Tony's allies or otherwise play her idol. So he waits until minutes before Tribal Council to talk with Michelle, Jeremy, and Nick, both creating a sense of urgency in their minds and ensuring that the potential for this to blow back against him is minimized as much as possible. Tony gets arguably his biggest competition out of the game, idol in her pocket, by striking right from the center. Tina also did this to some extent all the way back in Survivor Australia, waiting until the hike to Tribal Council to rally everyone against Mitchell. Although this was not filmed and players are no longer allowed to speak during this trek, so 
Good luck implementing this one. That's kind of why the whole Mitchell vote comes out of nowhere, because there's like no footage for it. While I'm guessing this happens more often than we see on TV, waiting until sundown to rally your troops is still underutilized in my opinion. You obviously have to be confident in your persuasion skills and have good social capital with the people you're talking to. But creating a FOMO sense of urgency is a time-tested psychological tactic that simply works. Now if you'll excuse me, Amazon's having another flash sale. The most surprisingly underused survivor strategy, of this list at least, is hiding a rock in your shorts to fake having an idol, most famously implemented by Rupert in Survivor Heroes vs. Villains. By the midpoint of the Heroes vs. Villains merge, the villains outnumber the heroes 5 to 3, and only the heroic trio of Colby, Rupert, and Candace remain. At the previous vote, Candace jumped over to the villain's side, so Colby and Rupert aren't exactly Billy tier fans of hers. With all those idols played by Parvati a few episodes ago now out of the game, the idol hunt is officially on. While Sandra finds the real deal, a very on-the-ropes Rupert decides to play like he has an idol, even though he doesn't. He fishes out a rock from a stream and puts it in his pocket, letting it weigh down his shorts just a little bit, then spends the afternoon wandering around in front of Russell's face. He found it. I see in his pocket. I know exactly how they look, and I know exactly how they look in a pocket. No shade intended here, but this is actually a move so clever that I'm surprised it came from Rupert's brain. One, he's playing into his reputation as non-strategic by putting the idol in his pocket. I mean, of course, if Rupert found an idol, he would just put it in his pocket, right? Two, he picked the perfect mark in Russell, who is both increasingly paranoid with every passing day, and very experienced with idols. And three, Rupert and Colby correctly read that the villains are going to split votes between Rupert and Candace and stack their two votes on Candace, getting her enough votes to send her to the jury and buy themselves some extra days in the game at the same time. Baiting a split vote and votes onto yourself is a situational move only for people who are desperate and on the bottom, but a split vote allows the minority much greater leverage in affecting the vote, whether that be in poaching one or two players from the majority over to your side, or by putting your votes on the other vote target. Anyway, did y'all notice? I actually made it an entire section talking about heroes versus villains, heavily featuring Candace, without dunking on her. It was not easy, and it took every ounce of resolve I have. You might say I'm a hero. Granted, the qualifications for that classification are low. Just look at this hero's tribe. I mean, for God's sake, Candace is on it. Ah, oh, fuck, I was so close. Got nothing else for ya. Don't hide your love like a rock in your pocket. Like and subscribe and I'll get you more Survivor content just like this. Until next time, don't get idled out.